As 2021 begins, Royal Dutch Shell is emerging from one of the most challenging years in the history of the energy industry. Oversupply in the oil market, combined with a sharp drop in energy demand broadly, made for a particularly difficult 2020. On top of that, the world has also changed since CEO Ben van Burden took over the range of the company back in 2014. Where investors were once looking for things like growing oil and gas production and finding new reserves, these days shareholders are seeking credible strategies to decarbonize and to thrive in the energy transition. Mr. Van Burden and Royal Dutch Shell have stated a commitment to make this complex transition. I sat down with him recently to discuss the company post-pandemic and how he sees the future of the energy industry. Mr. Van Burden, uh, the year 2020 was an incredibly challenging year for the oil and gas industry. What was it like uh, to be the CEO of a company like Shell in such a challenging year? Well, it was indeed a, a very challenging year, uh, Martijn. I think the most challenging part was, of course, in the beginning, partly also because you had expected the year to be something entirely different. But I think it was also a year in which we had to really act uh, vigorously, uh, make some really clear choices. Uh, and we did, and I'm happy that we, uh, that we acted uh, urgently and early. And I think it was also a year where we could show something else, namely how resilient the company is and, and how good we could respond. Now, in 2017, uh, Shell publicly committed to the, to the energy transition and it recognized the importance of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And I wanted to ask you about that journey. Um, what were the, the moments, the conversations, the data points where um, at some point you realized, yes, as Shell, we really need to do this? It is a journey. You're absolutely right, Martijn. And a journey that started, of course, well before I was CEO. But, but when I got to engage with it, it was probably the first time around in 2013, when I was on the executive committee, I was running the downstream, and we were deciding as a committee, together with the board, by the way, that we wanted to be not just a stick to your knitting company, we wanted to diversify much more vigorously into the other parts of the energy system. I think by 2000. Uh, 14, when I got on seat, uh, we were really sort of systematically looking into, you know, what is the future of energy going to look like? Uh, what choices can we make for our portfolio? What business models? I think by 2016, we had figured out that we needed to understand what it meant to be Paris compliant for a company like us. Because to just say, listen, we're going to be really good at some bits and pieces of the energy system was obviously not going to be good enough anymore. We had to be ahead of the pack. And I think by 2017, that had fully formed into, we need to look at our carbon footprint, we need to completely change the portfolio makeup of our company from a product perspective. We need to be moving in line, if not ahead of society. But that, as you can see, took us quite a few years to fully form as an insight. Now, the energy transition debate is so broad, I wanted to ask you, um, how you feel about the state of that debate and if there's something in that debate that concerns you? Oh, there's a lot of it, Martijn, that concerns me in that debate. Yeah? It, I think the, the debate never really, I think, was going particularly well for, for decades. I don't think it was a particularly productive debate. And, you know, just look at where we got to uh, since the, the 90s. Uh, we didn't make a lot of progress as a world, I, you could argue. Now, why would that be? I think partly because public policy was difficult to form. I, 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 uh, I would say that indeed uh, the energy literacy probably and the system understanding of those who create public policy was probably uh, insufficient. But I can't just put all the blame on policymakers. There's equally big blame, I think, for, on us as an industry. I think as an industry, we were probably too detached from the policy making. You're probably saying too much, let's see what happens, and then we will sort of play into the opportunities that it provides. And, uh, and maybe in some cases even push back on it. Um, and I think that just took uh, that for too long, to the point that I think now society got impatient, got frustrated, uh, of course, particularly after the Paris Agreement, particularly with the mobilization that, uh, that social media bring. And I think now we are at a point that we have lost so much time and ground as a world that the debate has become dysfunctional. But really simplistic ideas uh, about uh, you know, how uh, we should just uh, outlaw certain 
uh, energy forms, or we should uh, exclude people who know most of the energy system, or the very simplistic opportunities that are being touted as the way out here. And I think, therefore, we are, I think, a little bit more at risk that this transition may not be a terribly orderly transition after all. Now, you used the word orderly there, and if I can pick you up on that for a moment, uh, because if you look at most of the institutions, think tank, that do long-range energy modeling, they typically come up with a number of scenarios, and each, of the, each scenario individually often looks very smooth. Is, is that the risk that we're facing when you're bringing up that word orderly, that at some point we feel like we really have to accelerate? I do think that the smoothness that you observe or the inertia that you observe is real. And because there is no way we can very quickly turn over the tens of trillions of dollars of investment in the energy system. We cannot say, well, you know, all these cars, all these planes, all these power stations, let's scrap them next week and get another generation of, of, of assets in place. It doesn't work like that. There is a lot of inertia in the system. And that's exactly also the problem. Uh, it does mean that it, there's latency and therefore it takes time for policies to start to become effective and to start to have teeth. Let me give you an example. So, you know, 20 years ago, a company like us started talking about, let's put a price on carbon, knowing that that could be a really good way into changing the system. It could sort of make rational economic actors do the right thing. Uh, I think it took us too long as a society to adopt this wholesale. And as a result of it, you could now argue that, okay, we still need a carbon price urgently, not like 20 years ago, but on top of it, all the other policy interventions that we need to make are going to be so much more uh, profound if we have to make a change. Mandates, bans, uh, portfolio standards, all these things are going to be much more draconian because of the limited time that we now have left. If you zoom out, um, and you look at the overall state of the transition, the overall state of the debate, um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of scientists would argue that we're not quite on track. Well, first of all, Martijn, I would say, yes, as a, as a world, we are not on track, uh, even in the most sort of progressive and advanced economies uh, that have set the, the highest ambitions, uh, we are not on track. Uh, so what do we need then? Uh, now, a lot of people say we need more ambition, and, and that is absolutely true. But it's not just ambition that we need. We need more action as well. Um, and what we need is, is, is action, I think, that is more invasive uh, and action that is on more fronts. And OK, a carbon pricing mechanism would be helpful, but I think it is probably not going to be sufficient or invasive enough. We're not going to change the way sort of hard to abate sectors like aviation or shipping uh, or difficult sectors in the industry like steel or, uh, or cement, uh, or very personal sectors like your home and my home, that's not going to change because we have a carbon price. And that, I think, is what is missing most at this point in time, a clear view on more invasive action, which sounds scary uh, for a politician, and it is, but is also needed, and action on more fronts. A lot of people think, of course, you know, the energy transition is all about making greener electricity. But that, that's only a small part of the problem. We need to electrify the entire economy. And then on top of it, we have to make interventions in those sectors that cannot benefit from green electricity, that need other solutions. Are you seeing any signs that this is actually happening? It is happening, uh, I, and that's the, that's the good part. I do think that the mobilization within society since the Paris Agreement, uh, you could argue, or particularly since the Paris Agreement, has been quite profound. Take the ban on the internal combustion engine. Yeah, uh, That's an example of an invasive uh, uh, measure. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Now it's being considered acceptable. And we need more of these things as well. Uh, if we are going to decarbonize aviation, it's not going to be because we put a price on carbon or we make tickets a little bit more expensive. It's only going to work, or we're only going to get onto the road, if governments say you need to have a minimum percentage of sustainable aviation fuel in the mix. And every year we're going to ratchet that up. Now, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is in, is in Shell's customer-centric approach. And I think in that sense, um, Shell differentiates 
from the plants from other majors. Shell sells about 5% uh, of the world's energy consumption. So Shell serves a lot of customers. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you could describe as a company, what does that allow Shell to do, this, this broad customer base? Well, it, I think if you just stick with the, the energy transition narrative first, and I'll get to the commercial opportunities. Uh, so if you, and if you think about the energy transition, the energy transition is not about reforming supply and then demand will adjust itself. It's actually the other way around, of course. You, you reform demand and then new supply will come on to serve that demand. And I think that's where I think a company like us therefore needs to focus its role in society. We are people who can change or can at least make a bigger contribution to reforming demand. I just gave you an example on aviation. Let's take the aviation example again. So we are, I think, with something like 8% market share, the largest aviation fuel provider in the world. We serve uh, 900 plus airports with aviation fuel. So we actually have quite a bit of footprint to play around with new forms of aviation fuel, uh, biojet for instance. And that is a position that I think we can exploit much more if you want to play that role in the energy transition. So I think if you look at our strategy for dealing with the energy transition, working from the customer back, we just have much more in our toolkit, also with a 5% market share, than if you only could deal with providing a different type of commodity, which is of course what a lot of our competitors have as a strategy. All of these issues, um, they are not easy. And I can say from you know, some um, personal experience that one of the things I think investors are struggling with is the complexity of it all. In the sense that over the last decade at least, um, oil and gas has already become quite complex. There are many factors that go into oil and gas prices uh, and can be quite volatile. And then on top of that, um, investors need to get their heads around um, you know, a whole set of new markets, set of new technologies, many of them uh, still pretty much in their, in their infancy. What would you say to investors who simply say, look, Ben, it's, somewhat, it's too complicated for me? Well, I think, you know, there is, uh, there's also value in complexity. And let's be honest, it always was complex. Uh, and a lot of people who wanted to just conceive of us as a company that was a collection of oil and gas fields, and, and we had then this, this annoying complexity with marketing and chemicals and, and some trading, etc. And couldn't you just get rid of that? Uh, I think, you know, if you now look back on that episode, of course, we are happy that we didn't. Now, going forward, um, I would say it's the, the richness that we have in our portfolio, the fact that we indeed do have different businesses, different forms of energy, different types of solutions, may sound complex and feel complex from the outside, but it, at inside it gives us a tremendous amount of opportunity, option value, it gives us the opportunity to knit solutions together for customers that, that is really valuable. Take our gas business. A lot of people understand how the LNG business works. It's liquefying gas and selling it to a customer. I think everybody understands that if you have a complex network of supply and demand points, you can optimize and create value. That is complexity, but that is complexity that is also valuable. Now, along similar lines, uh, there's also a group of investors who basically say, look, just divest from oil and gas companies. The carbon footprint is too large. The ESG implications are too severe. Simply divest. I would, there's two ways of looking at it, Martijn. First of all, let's look at it from a more societal perspective. Of course, uh, divesting from oil and gas is one of the simplistic narratives I, I refer to. It won't change anything for this planet. Yeah? It's not as if we, we, we need equity injections all the time and therefore we need investors to keep the business going. So it's not changing to walk away from the investment if you look at it from a societal perspective. And I guess most investors also know that. Uh, you can look at it also from another perspective. If we are going to be successful in this energy transition, it is because large, complex, integrated companies who can do the transition at scale make it happen, companies like us. We're not going to decarbonize the aviation business with a number of startups. We're going to do it with companies like us. Now, as a final question, um the attraction of Shell has historically uh, as an investment is that people could um, hold on to it for a very long time. So it's, it's just Shell has historically had a set of shareholders who owned the company for many, many years. So um, let's roll the clock forward. If an investor 
buy shares in Shell today and holds on to those shares for say the next 10 years or so, by the early 2030s, what would the company look like that he, will, he or she will then have a share in? I think the company will have evolved, uh, but it will also, of course, in certain areas, uh, still look a little bit like the company today. I think you will see a uh, not only staying power, but probably uh, a bit of growth. We will continue to grow our, our gas business. I think we will probably, relatively speaking, materially grow our chemicals business because the mega trends of the energy transition are driving the opportunities there. And you'll probably see that our refining footprint is significantly smaller than what it is today. But that piece of the company will be, again, higher quality and will really be the platform to enable the growth of uh, the, uh, the third leg of the business, which is the future of energy. We will be much bigger in biofuels, probably three times as big as what we are today. Uh, we will be um, a very clearly emerging winner in hydrogen, which will still be a small business, but it will really show that we are, uh, that we are leading and in a way that, that really matters. Uh, you will see that our customer footprint is significantly larger and our offerings significantly more sophisticated. Uh, so yes, in that space, there will be a lot of change. Ben, that was a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for spending the time with us. All the best. Thank you very much, Martin. Happy to do it.